this. So my name's Marianne Carter and I'm um, Director for Conservation Capacity and Leadership at Fauna and Flora International. Um, I've been working for FFI for way too long. I think 2000 was when I first started working um, with FFI. So it seems an awfully long time. And the organization has changed enormously over that time. They used to, you know, used to be a tiny number of staff, no HR team, two people working in finance when I started. So the whole organization has tremendously transformed over the time I've been just the time I've been working there. Um, so I've seen that as, as somebody who's an employee of FFI and have been involved in some of the change initiatives. But also my role in building capacity has enabled me to also support individuals and institutions all around the world to help build their capacity. And that is essentially all around um, change for those organizations and those people um, and this talk today is sort of a little bit about how it can be really useful to think actually actively think about that change as well as do the change I guess um, and what I'm hoping to do is reflect some of what I've learned um, so a lot of the things I've done have involved change but often things weren't changing quite at the rate I expected or in quite the way I expected. Um, so just recognizing that need that there has to be effort and resources put in specifically got me um, started reading on this topic. And it's unbelievable how much um, resource has gone in, particularly in the private sector to, um, to find out ways of managing this change process. I mean, there's even a journal that's just focused on organizational change management. There's so much that you can read. In fact, it's kind of somewhat overwhelming. So in this session, what I'm hoping to do is um, just pull out a few of the things that I've picked up from that reading that I found useful as a conservationist um, working with all sorts of different kinds of institutions around the world um, in the hope that some of you might find it interesting as well. Um, so just thinking what we're going to cover in this session. Um, so really, it's it's going to be just a bit of an overview of some of the tools that are out there, not much of an overview, but I really want to um, focus your attention on some of the things it makes a huge difference if you pay attention to, um, and it's easy to forget if you don't. I'm really interested before I get underway to just um, get an understanding of why you're here so why have you joined this session so I wonder before we get properly going whether you could use the chat and type in in Spanish is fine if that's your language the English or Spanish type into the chat and just let me know why this topic is of interest to you I'll just give you a minute or so to do that And at the same time, I'll share my slide. Oh, so somebody's just about to experience some organizational change. So this is good timing, hopefully. Leading, oh, an NGO in Kazakhstan, brilliant. Yeah, I can understand that um, the growing pains. <laughs> I'm sympathetic. Yeah, our CEO is leaving next year. Fantastic. 
So lots of people who are experiencing change and have have some info it looks like there's quite a lot of people who have some direct involvement in that change process so that's really useful for me to understand um, I think one of those things is that change is non-stop in organizations it's you know organizations are dynamic beasts and are never going to stop changing so all of us experience change in our organizations but when there are particular changes coming across it's really useful to have some kind of thoughts and tools in your pocket to kind of refer to to help even if it's just give a reassurance that you're doing the right things um one thing i was going to pull out was i i had i read this um study which I think I should properly refer to it's Andrews et al in 2008 and this study looked at what change management tools were the most useful for managers who were practicing so they'd all studied all about change management looked at all these different models and um, so this study was all about okay which were the actual tools that those managers found useful and the really interesting sort of thing that came out of it was basically managing change in an organization is super complex and every organization has their own culture, their own environment. So there's not like a neat answer for any one organization or one individual because it depends on what you're changing, exactly what your culture is um, and exactly the environment you're working in. So the tools are very much you kind of pick up what are you what's useful and what's not but what they found the most useful in what they'd learned before they were involved in their change initiatives is the stuff that really enabled them to make sense of the organizational change that they then experienced so what I'm including in this talk is a bit of that bigger thinking background so there's lots of general stuff rather than specific tools because I think that makes sense to me so what they found was the useful thing was to reflect and have things to discuss around change management that helped make sure that they were being thoughtful in the specific route they were taking for their organization which would take its own kind of bespoke route if that makes sense so I'm going to stick very much to that kind of overview. OK, let me go to the next slide. I really like this um, image. I think I've used it a few times before, but I think it just is, is a really good way of highlighting that. I mean, there's nothing more permanent than change. Um, and we all want things to move on and change and evolve. We always want things to be better than they are, more efficient, more effective, faster. Um, but humans um, can really find change massively um, hard and challenging and exhausting. It takes a lot of energy <laughs> to change stuff. Um, and there are a lot of people who do really find that a struggle. So it's, it's a kind of interesting observation. I think here, having that process of thinking about changes means we've, we're kind of putting together a bit more of a structured approach for ensuring that those changes are effectively implemented and that there's lasting benefits. So rather than just focusing on the process of change itself or the thing you're changing, when you're thinking about change management, you're broadening that to look at the wider impacts of that change and particularly on people um, and the people in your organization and your stakeholders so individuals and teams how how you help them move from the current situation to the new one that you're hoping to push them into as part of this change um, so yeah so that's what this is about really it's about how we move our people to accept and embrace changes that that we're making and be a part of those changes so it's a very um, social process, I guess, within an organization. I kind of feel like at the very outset in this introduction, I can't really go on. I don't I don't want to put all these like depressing news <laughs> um, headlines up, but I can't really go on without kind of making um, making it clear that actually in our sector specifically so all organizations go through these kind of change processes but in our sector specifically at the moment um there is a massive context of urgency we have to in nature conservation 
focus our need for change even more than we ever have as all this evidence gathers about all these worsening scenarios for biodiversity and climate change that's putting a lot of pressure on organizations and individuals to transform and improve so that we can deliver our missions ever more effectively and more efficiently um, and I think it's a context that we have to kind of bear in, in take into account in terms of how this impacts our people as we go through this because there's this real push and energy for change not necessarily loads more resources there is opportunities um, but there's also massive challenges come with this this kind of pressure and real urgency that we must make huge changes now as a sector so when we're thinking of types of change sorry Flora, i know i'm zooming too fast <laughs> when we're thinking of types of change um there are there are a few kind of obvious ones so incremental change would be not changing that much so doing more of the same so you might be scaling up an initiative you might be you know reaching more counties you might be reaching um different communities or more countries um and then there's reform where you're not happy with the way things are right now or the structures of how things are so you might be working towards the same goals but you're using a different approach to get there so um, one example would be say um, the use of technology to make something more efficient so you're still trying to get to the same goal but you're you're changing how you do it because there's this amazing new technology that will help you get there more efficiently and faster and and more effectively um, but then the, the other type of change is transformative change, and that's what's being talked about a lot in terms of conservation. So that one is the seriously challenging kind of change. So where we're questioning our basic ways about thinking about issues and understanding the way things work, we're redefining our goals. Um, and there's changes, really significant changes in power structures and logic. It's just, you know, crazy levels of change. Um, but that's not the kind of change that any of us find easy to do, but is being asked of us in our sector. So I think this is kind of timely in a way that just, you know, we need to be thoughtful about how we make this happen, because we're going to be asking a lot of our people to really change things up. We've got to we've got to step it up and go for level three now um, because that's that's what's demanded to keep our planet going so that's not what this talks really about but I just think there is that um, backdrop behind us of kind of urgency and, and a pressure that comes with that to make change happen fast which adds pressure for change processes which might be slightly different in in other sectors This slide is just to recognize that there are different drivers of change. So, um, so for example, external forces of change might include political or social, environmental, technological, um, stakeholder context. These kinds of changes tend to be less in our control. But we can plan new strategic directions or approaches in order to manage them. And then there's the internally driven changes, which might be instigated due to things like new leadership coming in, somebody pointed out um, performance gaps where you're wanting to really improve effectiveness and efficiency. If somebody also mentioned um, why they're here, that their organization is growing, changing in size in any way. Um, or where there's employee needs and values that need to be taken into account that aren't already. So those kinds of internally driven needs are often the ones that are a lot more in our control that we can kind of predict and plan for. Um, and those ones that evolve slowly are the ones that are easiest to really be most thoughtful um, for planning for. Um, what I'm not going to talk about to now at all is kind of what to do in crises that was covered in a section i think it's actually online on um, available online now about what to do in crises you would do something a bit differently in terms of changing in a crisis um, it's, it's very much more di directive um, whereas if you've got a slow plan train change you can bring everybody on board so i just wanted to highlight that 
And then this slide is very much about that, the, really the argument of why I put together this session, I wanted to run this session is, in my experience, organisations often just very much focus on the processes and systems that they're changing and aren't really spending as much time or resource to consider and plan how they're going to help their people to get there. So change readiness isn't taken into consideration as much as it could be. Um, and the outcome of that is lots of resources and investments are made, but the expected outcomes aren't happening. And I think this diagram shows kind of really nicely. So the dotted line on the top is kind of when we think a change is happening, we just think performance is going to go up if we don't really think about it. Just we expect, oh, we're going to get this new amazing finance system. So we're going to be so much more productive. So we think our performance is going to go straight up. And actually what tends to happen is there's a decline and it takes a duration of recovery for an organization to even get back to where they were, never mind show the kind of advantages of taking on that change. And um, people find that quite hard, that gap in time, that recovery time, because, you know, we want things happening fast. I talked about that urgency we have to make these changes. So it's, you know, it's understanding that these processes take time and actually we have to be really realistic and have realistic expectations and communicate from the start the realities of actually what what does happen in a change we're going to expect not to be quite as productive while we work through this it's going to take a lot of your time and energy but eventually it will be an improvement for the organization so i think it's just a useful perspective and i talked about um, change readiness a little bit um, so this slide here is really just um, emphasizing that if you fail to consider how ready an organization is for a particular change, it presents risks to your organization. So I have seen cases in the past where leaders have been so convinced they have the right solution that they kind of overlook their organization's capacity to make that change. So they might underestimate the time, the resources or the effort required. Um, the way I think about it is if you had um you were going to send somebody to climb a big mountain and you wouldn't just kind of send them off you would think about their physical and mental capacity to be able to approach that challenge right you wouldn't send them knowing that they hadn't acquired the skills or to make that climb you wouldn't send them without proper equipment or guides in order to do that so just the same with organizations we need to equip our organizations for changes or we're basically putting our organization at risk for that period of of change um which i think all this is very kind of common sense stuff but it's just kind of thinking it through when we're we're planning a change initiative so um so the examples that i have around here which are just a few ideas i'd thought about of things that we can do to think about is my organization ready for change so at the top there there's a leader's capacity so what is leadership's capacity to actually lead this change so people need to feel that leaders have the competency and authority knowledge to lead the change so that credibility knowledge and skills that that leaders need to have makes a big impact as to whether staff then take up that change so making sure leaders understand that change and know what they're doing is actually really important. Um, leadership seems to be, from a lot of the stuff I've read, having the right leadership in place for, for managing change seems to be a really key factor in whether changes are successful or not. But it's not just about leaders. There's also um, considering middle management capacity. So in any change, people managers play a really key role as that conduit for information. Um, for feedback, if something goes wrong, it will tend to go to the line manager, the people managers. And if that manager doesn't understand or isn't willing to support the plan change, then they can really cause a barrier. And um, the enthusiasm and the energy that they offer, if that's not there, it can stop a change happening. So you have to ensure that obviously middle management are behind it and have the capacity to support their team to do that. 
and then kind of likewise employee capacity it's as much about laying that groundwork um and i know in in the area that we work we tend to have a lot of overtasked individuals that have so many things on their plates on a daily basis to have something extra on their plates i'm using the example of the um bringing in a new finance system for example them having to learn that system is going to take some of their time and it's going to take some of their energy and that has to be taken into account in terms of what they can then deliver in a day um, and if they don't feel they have the skills time or resources to actually make that change they might not be willing to adopt it um, they might feel too overwhelmed or might feel too tired and it might cause them kind of emotional and mental stress to be able to do that so we these things kind of have to be thought through and taken into account then down here at either side i've got really annoyingly the words don't fit on the thing understanding impact and understanding purpose but that again is really just making sure that everybody so looking at the purpose everybody understands that the change is not only in the interest of the organization but also in their interests to do so really understanding what it's for and what it's going to do for them um, in terms of the impact kind of having that understanding of what the effort will take so this is where we are now and really knowing where that is and this is where we're trying to get to so people really understand what it means for them and then this final one is on track record is just if if organizations have found change hard in the past they might find it hard again unless they change the way they're appro approaching it and their staff might not have faith that the change is going to go well if it's not gone well in the past so it's work that might need to be done to get to address that to get people behind a change before you embark on it um, i don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts they want to kind of throw in on this slide actually because I just plonked down a few of the ideas I had, but in terms of getting change ready, is there any other thoughts that people might have? You can drop thoughts in the chat or, or speak if you would like to. But those were a few of the things I thought of that it really helps to, to think about before you embark. I might give a chance for Flo to catch up. I'm going to go to the next slide. I really, really like this image um, because it really kind of helps you think. So change doesn't happen in isolation. It impacts the whole system and all and everybody is touched by that. But there's a whole bunch of things in an organization that people can see really easily. So here it's like the top of the iceberg. But people can kind of visibly see that an organization is doing but actually the way organizations get things done are actually often not very tangible <laughs> ways of looking at things so things like um, perceptions and um, values those unwritten rules relationships all those kinds of things that are really the heart of an organization in the center of an organization um, aren't visible but for organizational change, actually those things below the waterline are the things that really need attention um, in order to help people through change processes. So it's all about the actual people's interrelationships. Um, I think that's a really nice way of doing it because if you don't pay attention to these things below the waterline, the iceberg's going to start um, eroding away and then the whole iceberg will flip right if it's you know if it's eroded away underneath so I feel like I can really visualize that so our people are, are our biggest strength they have to be behind the change um, yet these are the hardest things to change in any organization so it just needs a, a bit of attention I just put things I like that slide and I think it's a really useful reminder how many of you already know about the change curve? I think this is quite a well-known kind of model. Um, 
and perhaps a few of you already know about this model but as I've been saying like the fact is organizations don't change because of new systems processes or structures they change because the people within that organization adapt and change too um, and it's only when the people in the organization have made their own personal transitions then an organization can really reap the benefits of whatever change you're trying to make um, so the easier you can make this journey for people the sooner your organization will benefit right and the more likely you are to be successful but individuals all go through changes at different rates and so it's not this like neat curve of um, when you let somebody know about the change that first graph I had then each of us sort of go through a different process of thinking before we can then really benefit from that change but some people might know about the change ahead of others some people it might be more difficult or affect them more than more than others um, so there's all these different rates that your staff might be going through this this process of change individually that have to be managed and thought about um, so if I kind of take you through this for those who haven't seen this um, model before. So the idea is that when you're first told about a change, that the first stage, um, I don't know, for example, if it's a change in leadership in the organization, because I know that is the case for some people here, the first um, reaction might be a shock or denial of people. And then Kind of this is when the reality of the change hits so even if a change has been well planned and you understand what's happening you just need that bit of time to adjust so at this stage people need information they need to understand what's happening they need to know where to go to get help um, so it's a really critical stage for communicating so you have to make sure you communicate often um, ensure you don't overwhelm people with communications um, because they may only be able to take a limited amount of communication at a time but you need to make sure that people know where to go for more information if they need it and make sure you take time to answer questions if they come up. So that first stage very much like the focus is on that need to communicate as the information sinks in about, oh, this is what's happening. So then stage two, people move on from that. So as they started to react to the change, they might start to feel concern or anger or resentment or fear as they don't, they're not sure of all the details of what's happening. They might resist change actively or passively they might feel the need to express their feelings or concerns or vent any anger that they have or concerns they have and what they say in this model is that that's kind of the danger zone so it's really important to really carefully manage that um, so it needs careful planning and, and preparation um, so you've got to really consider the potential impacts and objections that people might come to you with and prepare for those in advance so trying to address those early again with clear communication and support by taking action to kind of minimize and mitigate the problems that people will experience and as the reaction is um kind of personal it can be emotional for people so it's hard to preempt everything so you just have to kind of listen and watch during this stage um, and respond as possible so it's very much that supporting people through kind of that disruptive phase and then stage three um, you're kind of moving on a little bit so this is um, a kind of a turning point you're coming out of that kind of worry place and you're on your way to kind of making things happen so people are starting to accept the change and they're starting to need to test and explore what that means for them and they can do this more easily kind of from a practical point of view if you're organizing that change if there are ways that you can help and support them to do that um, so that might just be a case of giving them time to be able to get their head around and and apply that change or it might be that for the change that you're making that you can um, give them training or have workshops that help make sure people can learn and accept the new way of doing things um, and I think what, what it's really useful to think about here is that people aren't necessarily going to be 100% productive during this time they're testing so it's 
building in that contingency for that um, without putting too much pressure on them. So it's like that exploring, getting their head around it. And then the stage you've been waiting for is stage four, where you're in kind of celebration mode. The changes are second nature and people are embracing what you've planned um, and you really see the benefits. And one of the recommendations there is to actually celebrate that success. So while you're counting those benefits, um, don't take it for granted and you know publicly celebrate look this you know we've done this we've got through it and now we're reaping the rewards and celebrate that um, so that's what that process is about and I think it's quite a useful tool in terms of just helping remind okay at, at the beginning we have to do all this communication then we have to support and it might take a long time and people might get emotional then what things can we do to help them through that change you know how long can we give what additional training or or um, advice or mentorship can we offer um, and then it's a, a don't forget to celebrate and this model actually comes through it's it's about grief so it's the process that people go through um, through grief so that's where it originated and then somebody figured out that um, actually this is totally applicable to an organization as well um, so it's been adapted for that so I think I found that quite a kind of interesting useful useful one uh, just see yeah, can get to the next slide here we go oh so I'm not going to take you through loads of tools I said I wouldn't um I've got a couple that I'm just putting up there that I've had to go out and used um but just reiterating that point that there are like tons of tools um, out there to help facilitate organizational change processes and they're really easily accessible that particularly from the business sector um, there are some pieces of research from NGOs but most of it out there has been out there for years and years so this um, Kurt Lewin's work you know was in the 40s and 50s and it's still being applied today um, but just um, provides you with little ideas of different ways you can help yourself through each of those um, sections of the process. Um, I'd really recommend um, Mind Tools. So there's a website called Mind Tools. And if you look up change management on there, there's a whole host of different um, helpful tools that you can access to support you through um, changes. And you can kind of pick and choose the ones that are relevant for you at the at, at the kind of piece of the puzzle you're at at that that point in time so the one i've picked out here is is force field analysis um so for change to happen the forces of change have to outweigh the costs of change so it's quite a nice idea to have a look you know have a brainstorm about what are the, the forces that will push the change forward and what are the things that are going to be blocking and stopping that change and you can kind of rate those forces for change against the forces for resisting change to decide whether it's worth going ahead with that change, but also to help you think about, okay, if that's re resisting change, what can I, what can I alter to help, help that um, blocker? How can I reduce that block? Or how can I emphasize that force for change? So on balance, um, the change will happen successfully. So that's kind of quite a nice tool to use. And you can do that, you know, with across teams you can run workshops to help help that and it helps people think through actually why this is beneficial to do and why it's worthwhile to do another one i'm just i've just picked up two of kurt lewin's because i i found them quite useful is this um process where um in his model it's you go through unfreeze change and refreeze so unfreeze is the prep preparing for change phase so it's about kind of analyzing how things work now so you understand what needs to change and how you're going to get the results that you want and in you're doing your communicating at this stage so you're making the case to your employees you're communicating what's expected and everyone's kind of clear about the plan then there's change, which is the implementation phase. So putting those changes into practice, we have to, again, keep communicating and providing support to employees. And then the refreeze is actually the kind of bit that people often forget about um, where, I don't know, sometimes money runs out or energy runs out, but to avoid falling back into that old way of doing things, um, 
it's really helpful to develop a strategy and really think from the beginning um, how can we keep checking in and making sure that change sticks and, and people don't go back to to the old way of doing things and you know review how are you going to measure those things so they're the three areas that um, Kurt Lewin suggested like way back in the 1950s but it's actually quite useful when you're thinking about making a change in an organization just to think through those those three areas but as I say there's like millions of mind-boggling number of tools out there I'm kind of conscious of time but I really uh, would love to just um, pause for a moment because I has I saw when you all kind of turned up and put your things into the chat that all of you have had some involvement or are having some involvement in organizational change at the moment and I think as I said at the beginning the study that was done one of the most useful things to do to help you with your organizational change is to come together and with others and get tips and reflect on you know how changes have gone for you so could I ask of you, even though, I don't know, it might be a difficult time of day for your brain to keep working, just to spend a couple of minutes just thinking, have you got any tips that you could share that in your experience has made organisational change more likely to be successful? Um, so what things have worked in your organisations? Um, and looking at who's on this call i'm sure there's some really amazing stories where you've found ways to help um help change happen in a kind of smooth and happy way for your organization a stress-free way i'm trying to look at the chat so feel free to add comments into the chat but also um if anybody would like to call out that would be also lovely to hear but I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to think. Oh, good. I can see Jess's hands up. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Hi, no problem. Um, yeah, I think maybe I've got, I don't know if I call it tips, but kind of things, things that have worked for me maybe in the past. Um, the first one's really obvious, and I think you mentioned it before, but I find it is very powerful. And that is really laying out your reason for change. I think you called it your purpose. Um, and so what I have done in the past is spent quite a long time formulating a why statement. So that is one or two sentences about why it's so important to change. And then you just say it over and over and over again. Every time you communicate, every time you train, every time you celebrate, everything goes back to that why statement and it just makes a really clear consistent kind of journey for people to go through so like I say quite an obvious common sense one but effective um and then the other thing that I quite often think about is um like who the change comes from like as in for an individual who are you hearing that from and a mix of kind of top down and bottom up approaches so you would want you're in an organization setting you would want your senior leaders or your ceo to be your real face of that change um but then if it's only the senior leadership who keep going on and on and on about it it doesn't stick you need to see that um reflected by your colleagues by your manager you need kind of everybody that you interact with and people that you trust and you talk to on a daily basis also in line with that change that the senior management team are, are, are the face of so kind of mixing those top down bottom up approaches thanks jess those are really really good ones anybody else got anything that they would that they've had a, you know they've tried or they've seen or experienced that they were like that worked really well that really helped our organization through that or helped me feel calmer about a change I won't make it too painful for everyone. That's why I'm talking a lot in this because I had a like a heads up that it's like in webinars, it's quite nice just to listen, isn't it? <laughs> um, especially when it's the end of the day for some people. 
but if you do have ideas, I mean, please do share them. And it, even if I don't stop for a long time now, feel free to type them in the text because it's really, really useful to really get those um, get those actual practical perspectives. I know some of you who will have been to some of the sessions today will have heard some examples, um, which is why I haven't really focused on specific examples here, because hopefully there's been a flavour for those who've been able to attend some of the other sessions today. So I'm going to share some of mine then, if there's not many others. And, uh, there's so many actually horrible pictures that I've just picked off the internet in here <laughs> and you wouldn't believe how long I spent taking like pulling off these pictures um, for them not to be as spectacular as I would hope but I hope there's some nice ideas so I think Jess maybe yours is like getting a network of committed people who are in support of the change that are not just your leaders but are coming from all different parts of the, the organization um, if you have some really good supporters that are really well distributed across the organization it can really help that change come to life um, the one the one here at the top left develop a shared vision to build ownership so that's the opportunity to not make all the decisions up front about how a change is going to happen but to open that up for staff to be involved in how should how should or could that change happen? What actually are we looking at? And can we all build that vision together? Not just a few people in the organization making that decision for change. It's that shared ownership and that ownership will help bring people to that change so much faster and more easily. So that one, again, is a kind of obvious one, but it doesn't always happen that way. Um, so it's worth highlighting. Um, oh, horrible ear, listen carefully and address concerns. But again, this is just so much common sense, but when you're kind of manically going through a big change, which takes a lot of energy as a leader of that change process, it sometimes does just take that extra bit of thought to take that time and stop and really listen to how people are feeling about it. And it's not only listening, but it's doing something about what they say, which is not always easy actually. So there were some things that inevitably always come up that you can't do anything about but you still need to respond um, to bring to bring along as many people as you want um but here so find the mvi the minimum viable improvement so sometimes when you're going through like a, maybe a bigger complicated change there might be a few little things that you can do to improve the situation or head you in the right direction that aren't going to take a massive amount of effort they might not be very expensive and it might be easy to bring people along or bring it build enthusiasm for um, so one example i know uh, an organization who um, actually they were they were take, they had a whole new strategy and they were employing a lot more staff they just got a new grant in um, but the building that the organization was in was quite kind of shabby and all they did was paint the walls and put some pictures on but the um, change that brought among their staff was really significant and it cost like you know a pot of paint and and a few pictures from a charity shop <laughs> put around the building and um everyone felt better about the organization and felt you know oh there's things things are going to change here things can happen and we are moving in a positive direction so it needn't be like huge big things finding a few little things to start stepping you in the right direction can just help bring people along and make people feel like things are moving because sometimes the really hard big part of the change is going to take a while to get there and people aren't going to feel that benefit for for ages so you want to find something where people can feel good sooner and feel like it's worthwhile doing Marianne yeah I'm sorry, uh, Fabiola had her hand up before. Oh, Fabiola, um, sorry, I couldn't see. Sorry about that. Fabiola, um, do you want to jump in? Oh, no, no, no worries. Uh, I was too late. I was still thinking. <laughs> but oh, no, it's I, good. I'm still talking about these things. So it's still, you're still very welcome. <laughs> yeah. OK, I thought that setting up milestones, but you, I think you just mentioned that, like, you know, to celebrate because Sometimes changes are, are difficult and are big and people are scared of them. 
So setting up little things that people can feel and can see um, gets people motivated. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. And just, you know, little celebrations along the way of just, yeah, those little milestones. I think that's a really, really good point. And I don't have that here. So thank you. Thank you for jumping in. And anyone else, if it's something comes to mind, do also jump in and but let me know if your hands are up, because I for some reason it didn't come up um, easily for me to see. Thank you for that, Fabiola. So the other things I have is just um, that again, it's not just focusing on the process that you're changing itself, but taking that time to recognize existing organizational culture. So I've already talked a little bit about that, but some of those less visible, relational, um, emotional sides of an organization that people don't like to talk about because they're a bit too slushy and mushy and fluffy. Um, but actually in these processes are really important to pay attention to. Um, measuring success which i think kind of also goes along with fabiola's piece where you know when you've made a milestone that you can celebrate you only know that if you have an idea of how you're gonna know that you've been successful or that you've moved forward um so just having some kind of structure that says yes we've managed to get there um in in these incremental steps can be really helpful uh what have i got oh yeah monitoring adjust strategies in response to problems is just that it's not a rigid process that it's really useful to flex because somebody might come up with a really good reason why your planned change can't go the exact way you planned there might be a better way to do it or there might be something that needs to happen differently and being open to that um, and not just saying no this is my plan i'm going to drive it forward whatever's happening is not always the best idea and i'm sure none of you would do that but i have seen it happen before um where an investment's been made in a, you know, in a certain tool or approach and people are very reluctant to go against it, but it might mean that the whole thing falls down. So just if you, from the outset, know to keep a bit of flexibility in there, it, it might help you along the way. Um, we talked a little bit about maximizing enablers and minimizing blockers. So that's very much that force field analysis I talked about um walking the talk again is that role of leadership but anyone who's kind of driving through a change process you have to be doing that yourself so going back to the you know new finance um system if you're not actually using that finance system yourself then um but you're saying yeah everyone should that that's not going to look too good so you've got to really walk the talk and show show people and lead by example um and then the last one I've got here is that sustaining and reinforcing and I feel like that is one of the hardest ones and it's kind of hard to underestimate so I think often with these things there's quite a big fanfare at the start of changes and some of the things kind of happen and are clear but then when you've done the major kind of um, implementation of the change there's often a lot still to happen because the actual impact of all of your staff getting there because they all get there at different stages may take a lot longer than you getting there um, so just making sure that you keep reinforcing and sustaining that message over time um, and it may take longer than you lo longer than you think um, is something that people don't always keep the resource the resource for or the energy for but actually can make the difference in the end so any others that people have before i move on i am nearly at the end so the other um slide that i wanted to show you was this one and it's my final slide and i like this one because i where i got these bullet points from was um, a conversation I had with a number of organizational leaders that I've worked with in conservation. So I was at um, an international meeting where there was a whole whole lot of people I was talking to about this topic. Um, and I just asked them, what tips and lessons have you learned in change processes? And this is kind of a summary of what they said. So a lot of the other stuff I've talked about has come, I mean, from quite old work um and has come from the private sector but this is very much relevant to our context and what those people said were um 
really that leadership role is very important and having somebody driving and leading in a very convincing and you know following through that change way is really can make a difference in any change so it's really important and really have to make sure that those who are leading know exactly kind of what they're doing and have that plan in place um, investing in preparation for a change is worthwhile so a lot of what I've been talking about is just saying have a little think before you make that change it's not just about the process what how will your people respond to this change and how can we think about those impacts up front rather than part way through the process um, again that point that I just made it's not rigid that you, it's very valuable to kind of leave in some flexibility um, this hasn't really come up so much but the value in promoting diverse engagement and being inclusive as you go through the change process so that different kinds of people are coming along with you or are included in that decision making process so that you get buy in right across your organization and your stakeholders if it impacts them too. Um, there's a point that a couple of people made on if your organization is willing to experiment and try new things and test new things people tend to be more open to change because they're used to testing and trying things and going with it if it works so you can promote a culture of that in your organization and a culture of reflection and learning so that you can move on from those processes having kind of built on what you've done already so i think that's a kind of really interesting point and again can be a hard one to bring in an organization where that's not obviously there already but could could really help you. Good communication is key. I think that's come across um, quite clearly. There's a piece there also about well-being. So I said that change just is draining, um, even if it's wonderful and exciting change, even if everything about that change is positive and exciting, it still takes energy and effort. And you need to foster your people's well-being throughout the process and always, but um, throughout this process in particular, and really think about that. Um, we've highlighted the, yeah, it can take a long time, so you have to be patient. And then a final one, which I also don't think came out, but it's just external networks can actually be really incredibly valuable for helping change processes. So lots of organizations like all of ours, that all of our conservation organizations, those who are on this call, um, lots of changes are quite similar that we're making. So we have our own context and our own cultures in our organizations. They're all different sizes. They you know, work in slightly different ways, but there will be other people who have had similar experiences that might be willing to help, you know, offer advice. And um, that can be incredibly useful. So having mentors and bringing in, you know, bringing in people who've already been through similar changes and said, oh, this really worked for us or this didn't might help you through that process. And some organizations, if you have really good, strong networks, can also potentially help resource that change planning process as well so it's sort of keeping your um, tentacles aware and open for picking up those kinds of opportunities too so those were the key things that came up from those conversations i had and it, it was a couple of years ago now and we've had a enormous amount of change happen in the universe since those times but i think they all still hold up um very much so in terms of uh, things that we need to do going forward so those were the main things or all the things I wanted to get across to you today. Um, and again, very much just my ramblings from kind of experience I've had, but also some of the things that I read and thought that really strikes a chord with me and um, and I will use that going forward. So I hope that there are a few things that perhaps made you think or gave you a bit of direction in your thinking as you come across your changes. And thank you very much for joining. It's really, really a pleasure to, to have an opportunity to see you all today and um, enjoy the rest of your days. Sorry for talking so fast, Floor. Thank you so much, Marianne. I think we have time to potentially squeeze in just one small question. Does anybody have anything to ask? Lots of thanks coming through on the chat, Marianne particularly for the practical advice.
So thank you so much, everybody, um, and hopefully see some of you tomorrow and to head on to the Slack channel to continue the conversation um, and take care. Okay, bye. Bye.